Welcome to the Society of Critical Care Medicine's Project Dispatch webcast, Patient Monitoring and the Use of Checklists During Bedside Procedures. This session is part of the unique webcast series, Patient Safety During Bedside Procedures in the ICU. My name is Roy Constantine. I am the co-chair of the Patient Safety Committee, Society of Critical Care Medicine Surgery Section, and Secretary of the Council for Surgical and Perioperative Safety. I am also the Assistant Director of Mid-Level Practitioners at St. Francis Hospital, the Heart Center, in Roslyn, New York. I have no relevant dis disclosures. Today's webcast is supported by a grant from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. The content is solely the responsibility of the presenters and does not necessarily represent the official views of AHRQ. This, web class, this webcast will include approximately 40 minutes of content. Due to the short nature of this educational activity, there will not be CE or CME offered. You are invited to ask questions for our, rep our presenters throughout the webcast. You may do so by typing your questions into the question box in your GoToWebinar panel. Questions will be addressed after the presentation. You will also have the opportunity to participate in several interactive polls. When you see a poll, simply click the bubble next to your choice. This webcast will, will be available at www.sccm.org backslash Project Dispatch or on Society of Critical Care Medicine's YouTube channel within three business days. We invite you to share this and the many other ICU liberation webcasts and patient stories with your colleagues widely. Post on Facebook if you like this webcast and if you tweet, tweet on using hashtag Project Dispatch during this webcast to spread the word. Today's program will focus on optimizing the implementation of crisis-directed protocols in the critical care setting, optimizing patient safety during bedside interventions, optimizing patient-centered outcomes, optimizing team performance, and optimizing training. It's now my pleasure to introduce our presenter today, Tio Forsh Dagi, MD. Dr. Dagi is a neurosurgeon and intensivist with faculty appointments at Harvard and Queens University, Belfast. He has particular interests in patient safety, ICU training, and protocolized care. His recent work has focused on non-invasive intracranial pressure and cerebral blood flow monitoring. He is also interested in field expedient intensive care spaces for mass casualty disasters. Dr. Doggy has no relevant disclosures. Now I will turn the program over to Dr. Doggy. Hello, my name is Theo Force Doggy. It's a privilege to be here and to talk to you today. Uh, our interests are really in optimizing patient monitoring patient resp the response to adverse events that occur in the ICU, to use a checklist for crisis response during bedside procedures in the ICU, and more broadly, the implementation of tools and practices to reinforce a culture of safety. The learning objectives for today's discussion are three. First, to assess preparedness to respond to crises during bedside procedures. Second, to implement crisis checklists in the ICU. And third, to train and practice team-based and team-mediated emergency responses. We're going to start with a poll question. When you perform bedside procedures in the ICU, how many providers are typically present? Are you generally alone? Are there two providers? Or are there three or more providers? 
according to the quick poll, 15% of us are alone, 60% of us work in teams of two, and 25% of us work in teams of three or more. As you will see, this is very important. Ideally, there would always be at least two providers. Do you have a protocol for crisis management during bedside procedures in your ICU? Please answer yes or no. Twenty-two percent do have such a protocol. Seventy-eight percent do not. One of the objects of today's discussion is to outline and to highlight the advantages of having protocols for crisis management, not a single protocol, but protocols that are appropriate for the crisis at hand. Let's start with the discussion. Modern critical care begins with the uh, post-myocardial infarction arrhythmia monitoring in the 1960s. Prior to the 1960s, not much was actually done. Patients were put on aspirin, they were monitored, but they were based, there was basically not much that could be done. But in the 1960s, intensive care units were started. Nurses were trained and authorized to respond immediately and in large measure independently to abnormal cardiac events. Monitoring was not the point. The point was that monitoring would lead to intervention. And it was shown that relatively instant diagnosis and response reduced short-term arrhythmia-related mortality. As a result, intensive care units were not only a place where teams gathered to tend to patients, but places in which continuous or at least very frequent monitoring was the rule and there was centralized observation of what the monitoring screens actually sh showed. Monitoring involves both screening and early diagnoses. And that's because there are two types of crises. One is named and imminent, so ventricular fibrillation, cardiac arrest, respiratory arrest. The second is around ever-present threats that may never actually come to pass for any particular patient, but will be very important to think about in populations of patients. And these range from sepsis to pneumonia to pulmonary embolus. And I'm sure each of you, from your experience, can come up with many other examples. And so there are two things that we do in the ICU when it comes to monitoring and when it comes to intervention. The first is detection, and detection is about detecting something that is about to happen or that has happened. We prefer to be able to come in just before an event, but sometimes we can't. The second is the idea of a trend. If we see, for example, that a patient is deteriorating, we don't necessarily know what the critical event might be but we want to, pre to preempt whatever events might threaten the well-being of the patient, and that we call preemption. So the purpose of the monitoring is to show us clinical data and physiological data that allow us to come to the diagnosis that is necessary for intervention. It's very useful to think in terms of protocol-based interventions in times of crisis. Well, what is a protocol? A protocol is actually a pre-positioned set of responses that are learned and that are agreed upon and ideally can actually be measured and can actually be assayed to make sure that they are accomplishing what they are meant to accomplish. There are two kinds. First, an automatically triggered protocol in which the diagnosis is usually self-evident, intervention is instant, 
the cause is either obvious or not immediately relevant, what you might do is to oversee and then reverse a severe event, a critical event, such as a unplanned extubation, a cardiac arrest, a pneumothorax. What actually caused the extubation, what actually caused the cardiac arrest is less important at that moment than the fact that the patient's life and well-being are both threatened by these events, whatever they may be. When you don't have an automatically triggered protocol, typically you're dealing with a more complex situation. The cause is generally not obvious. No instant intervention is required. There may or may not be a protocol deployed, but if there is a protocol deployed, the protocol is not necessarily automatically triggered. It may involve discussion or agreement or orders given to the team by the physician in charge. Typically, we respond to a crisis when there is a monitored physiological change, when there is an alert from a monitor. We confirm that the physiological change has actually taken place and we're not dealing with the failure of a monitor. We then become involved with bedside intervention and stabilization of the patient. Often, we need to implement a new protocol. And by that, what I mean is the previous treatment that resulted in the, or that occasioned the uh, crisis needs to be modified. So existing protocols are modified, then we substitute new protocols, and then we resume monitoring. And most everybody who works in intensive care spaces undergoes this kind of response pattern several times a day. Now, this has risks. The first is an error in diagnosis. So we want to make sure that what seems to be a physiological crisis really is. The second is an error in protocol selection. So if a patient, for example, is going into an acute pulmonary arrest, it's important to make sure that the protocol that is selected is appropriate for that event. The third is an error in protocol implementation. The protocol that is selected is correct, but in its implementation, there is error. The next is that as a consequence of the implementation of the protocol, a new complication arises. The fear, the danger, the risk, is that the patient is ignored because staff are really involved in implementing the protocol. And the patient is ignored while the protocols are implemented and also while the complications arise. The purpose of today's discussion is to try to mitigate some of these problems. And there's several ways to do so, but one very important expedient is the introduction of checklists and other cognitive aids into the ICU. Alongside protocols for monitoring, alongside protocols for urgent triggered or non-triggered urgent intervention, the recommendation is the checklists be implemented the checklists be, using, be used as part of a team building exercise. The checklists be incorporated into communications among staff in the ICU. The teams practice with checklists and that the checklists be refined and be developed into strong and very often reviewed instruments. What are checklists and why do they make a difference? Checklists and related cognitive aids aid in risk reduction. They are designed to compensate for lapses of memory, of attention, of knowledge, and of information. Clearly, these lapses are not the same. 
but each of them can prejudice the outcome of a patient. They're designed to optimize the scope of action, the sequence of actions, the completeness of a task, and the consistency with which a response takes place. They optimize training. They stimulate, but they neither replace nor do they displace thinking and clinical involvement. Where did the checklist come from? Of late, it's been thought of as something which is particular for the operating room. But in fact, it starts someplace very different. In July of 1934, the United States Army specified a new bomber, and there were three airplanes that were being considered. The Boeing, though untested, won handily. Everybody thought it would save the company. Insofar as Boeing was concerned, it was the pride of Boeing and the best plane that had ever been built. There was a test flight in October of 1935. The command pilot had not previously flown the plane. The co-pilot had, in fact, performed previous evaluation flights. Others from Boeing were also on the plane and they include the chief test pilot, a Boeing mechanic, and a representative of the engine manufacturer. The airplane took off, it taxied, it climbed, suddenly it stalled, turned on one wing, and fell, bursting into flames. Three of the people climbed out of the wreckage. Two were rescued, but later died. These are pictures of the three involved, of the three um, involved who uh, lived. This was seen as a catastrophic failure, and these are photographs of the crash. The cockpit of the B-17 was incredibly complicated, especially for that time, but even today, not only in terms of the number of dials, but in terms of the sequence of events that had to be carried out in order to fly the plane. In fact, when we look at it, we might say some of the aspects of this cockpit are very reminiscent of the ICU. An investigation was carried out as a matter of course. Was this pilot error? The elevator controls, particular controls to have the plane uh, fly and rise and drop, had not been unlocked. Had Hill, the pilot, neglected to release the elevator lock, which is generally locked on the ground. One of the passengers, Tower, realized what happened but could not actually reach the lock handle in time from where he sat in the rear of the, of the cockpit. The official explanation was that the crash occurred because the crew had neglected to remove the devices intended to keep the control surfaces from moving when the plane was on the ground. Conclusion, this was too much plane for one man to fly. The final cause determination, which is the name for the final dispositive uh, report, was that the cause was ambiguous but it was probably human error. It was clear that the controls had been locked, and there were a number of possibilities. One was that they were never unlocked. The second was that the locking pin was only partially withdrawn from the way in which it was supposed to be positioned at the time that it should have been uh, free. And the third was that the system malfunctioned. However, they concluded, there is no evidence to show that the system had ever malfunctioned, but due to the inherent design, it must be considered a possibility. Too much plane for one man to fly. That was a very challenging statement. As a result, Boeing lost the contract to Douglas. The Boeing model was ultimately <clears throat> uh, put on the back burner and the DB-1 was the one that was finally chosen. The Boeing model, however, was preferred by the Army, and through legal loopholes, 12 more planes 
were, deliver, were delivered to the Army Air Force in 1937. The pilots also loved the plane, and they developed the idea of having a checklist to make sure that the plane could be and would be flown safety. The checklist was intended to make sure that the sequence of acts that needed to be performed, of tasks that needed to be seen to for each phase of flight would be carried out correctly. Four phases of flight were identified. Takeoff, flight itself, before landing, and after landing. The checklist was published, of course. It worked. It was considered top secret for many, many years. It was detailed, as you can see, and it actually showed all the things that needed to be done, including things like the sequence of power changes. As a result, the B-17 was in fact adopted. The 12 loophole aircraft flew over 1.8 million miles without incident, and the plane model, the B-17, flew over 220,000 successful sorties. Of the 12,371 bombers produced, 13 are still airworthy, an absolutely remarkable accomplishment. In retrospect, this was not really too much of an airplane for one man to fly. It was too complex for any one man's memory to grasp reliably. The checklist assured that nothing was forgotten. It reduced both the likelihood or the probability that an error would occur and the incidence of error itself. Now the checklist addressed only one real type of error, systematic or random error. Non-random error, non-systematic error could not be addressed. Checklists were subsequently developed for other crew members and then for other aircraft and for other purposes. I had the privilege of serving as a flight surgeon and was given my own checklist as a flight surgeon for medicine delivered to the flight crew and in flight. What does the checklist actually do? It assures that there is no step left behind. It's an algorithmic listing of actions or tasks to be performed in a given situation. There are two kinds of situations that the checklist is good for. One, a situation that has the potential to become catastrophic, and the second, a situation that has become catastrophic. However, a crisis situation is not by any sense necessary for the implementation of a checklist to be effective. The checklist assures that no step is forgotten or left behind. It is a parachute for a good protocol. It makes good care better. A checklist cannot necessarily assure that the implementation is done correctly, but it is a wonderful first step. So let us ask a poll. Those of you who have protocols, and we realize that it's not everybody. Are there different protocols for different procedures, or is there only one protocol for every procedure? And it's about half and half. About half of you use one protocol, and half of you use directed protocols. That's very important and we will get back to that. So what's a protocol? We foreshadowed this a couple of minutes ago. A protocol is a preconditioned list of tasks, actions, and checks. A protocol is defined in terms of the scope and sequence of the protocol itself and of the actions or tasks that need to be carried out. A protocol is often deemed to be self-verifying because the protocol has been put in place in advance of need, it has been thought through and validated. And in theory, once a protocol is put in place and validated, following the protocol should result in an optimized outcomes.
The important thing to keep in mind is that checklists act as validated protocols. Checklists or validated protocols can be assembled or put together, they can be taught, and they can be learned. They help in training for crisis response, they help the learning process, and because they actually help in implementing the crisis response, they're useful to help build a team and help the team practice. How do checklists actually reduce errors? Well, there are a number of different kinds of tasks that come out of a crisis and come out of a protocol. The first is schematic behavior. This is performed reflexively or on autopilot. So somebody has a cardiac arrest, the first thing you may do is a chest thump. That's schematic or reflexive behavior. Then there's attentional behavior requiring active planning. You look at the EKG, you see the EKG as a problem, you solve the problem, you give what is meant to be the appropriate medication. And most tasks involved some combination of schematic and attentional behavior. But the types of error associated with each behavior are different. There are two types of errors that are very commonly distinguished. One is slips, which is failures of schematic behavior caused by lapses in concentration, distractions, or fatigue. So you should have given a cardiac thump, but you didn't give a cardiac thump. That's a slip. The second is a mistake, a failure of attentional behavior. You mean to give a cardiac thump, but you don't know how, you're not sufficiently trained, or you don't know where to put it. That's a mistake as opposed to a slip. More errors are caused by slip than by mistakes. Checklists are effective for slips. They are not reliably useful to overcome mistakes. And that's why we said earlier that the implementation of a protocol is as important as the protocol itself and its validity. The operating principle behind the use of checklists is that standardizing the list of steps to be followed and formalizing the expectation that every step will be followed for every patient may greatly reduce errors due to slips. And AHRQ has a paper on that that I welcome you to review. When are checklists plausible? Are they always useful? Well, remember, checklists are validated protocols. Validated protocols are plausible when it is possible to establish, to systematize, and to validate optimal responses in a very specific context. Predictable, predictable effects, a relatively small number of decision paths, and evidence-based preferences and actions that follow the decision paths and allow to select which ones are likely to be most effective. Checklists are a very plausible instrument for the clinical care unit. They may be less plausible in other settings. Checklists enhance crisis recognition. Recognition, as we've said, is a prerequisite to response. If it's not clear that there's a problem, it's not clear that there will be a response. Rehearsing or training with checklists appears to accelerate the process of alerting, which is the realization that something may be wrong, perhaps the formal realization. It's just not a nagging feeling. It's a conviction that something may be wrong. The recognition and diagnosis of a problem which says that something is actually awry. The immediate intervention to support a patient and a patient's need and mitigation of the underlying cause. Why put checklists in the ICU? One could argue that that's the last place in the world which one would need a checklist. 
ICU personnel are dedicated, devoted, mostly very well trained, very well experienced, and very well practiced. Training and experience, however, do not protect against slips. More errors are caused by slips than by mistakes, and protocol errors are almost always slips. The practice of using a checklist is optimized to reduce slips. Checklists have to be designed with great care. If you recall, earlier in our discussion, we distinguished between events and trends. Critical care checklists need to be designed to encompass both event-based crises and potential or actual trend-based crises. Checklists can be paper-based. Many people like that because it's something tangible that can actually be held. The best checklists, however, use a tablet or some kind of computer attached to a crash art or to a similar mobile unit with a paper backup. The purpose of the checklist is to reflect the diagnostic and treatment protocol that would be applicable to the situation and to be a really good checklist, it has to incorporate the possibility that a monitor or a monitoring device is dysfunctional. Checklists are most effective if the steps in the checklist are memorized during training. That doesn't necessarily mean that one uses one's memory instead of a checklist, but one uses a checklist with the memory in mind. It is important that the steps in responding to a crisis be monitored with the checklist in hand. One may want to include directions to supplies and instruments if they are not obvious together with the checklist design and the response. In general, there are several rules that are really helpful. One is to make sure that the event or the trend suspected and implicated has actually occurred. The second is to check the monitoring instrument to make sure that the data that are being provided are correct. The third is to call for help. Next, the primary caretaker begins the emergency intervention and ideally there is someone there, and I use the word assistant not in a hierarchical way, but because one person will have assumed responsibility for implementing the protocol and the next person there will assist that individual. So the assistant would read out loud from the checklist. The primary caretaker formally acknowledged steps read and the interventions implemented as they occur. Now the last point here is very important. The assistant watches the patient, not the caretaker, but the patient. The patient and the monitor, but not the caretaker, because it's very important that somebody be available to make sure that the checklist is having the effect desired on the patient. After the intervention, there are a series of questions that need to be answered. This is the after action debrief. In addition to everything else that will be discussed about the patient's vulnerability, steps to have preempted or to have prevented a crisis, whether the crisis was handled correctly, at the end, the following questions should be asked. Was a checklist available? Was the checklist followed? Was it complete? Was it effective? Was it adequate? Were supplies available? And for many places we would add, if the supplies were available, was a notation made as to where those supplies might be to facilitate finding them quickly? The answers should be noted in the chart Although some organizations prefer not to put this information in a chart, but rather have it elsewhere. At the end of the day, it's terribly important to teach to the checklist. New members of the team, returning members, 
or on a regular basis, even people who have been parts of the team for a very long time. You need to go back and review the checklist and use the checklist exactly for what it's intended, which is to say a systematic approach to patient safety and crisis management. One of the advantage of a crisis checklist is that it educates providers on the science of safety. The ma vast majority of errors, it turns out, aren't the results of one provider alone, but rather a whole system that allows the error to occur. It's important to spend time performing an after action. It's important to use written surveys to teach how the next patient could be harmed and what might be done to reduce that harm. It is important to, look, to identify, to archive, and to learn from defects or problems. And it is very helpful to implement teamwork tools and training programs around the checklists. And while nobody would say that the checklists have to be exclusively the only means to train to respond to crisis, they are actually very, very helpful, as the next few slides will show you. One interesting study published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2013 shows that 63% of steps are missed when checklists are available and only 23% when they are not. I made a mistake. I said 63, I meant 6% of steps are missed when checklists are available and, only, and 23 when they are not. In critical care, one needs to assume that crises will happen. One needs to assume that personnel are competent to deal with these crises. One needs to break the crises into phases, much as the pilots broke down flight operations into phases. So there's recognition, there's communication, there's acknowledgement, there's response, and then there is resolution. Each phase entails particular actions. The key is to employ the checklist correctly at each stage. One of the things we see is that the number of papers around cognitive aids, checklists, and checklist utilization has absolutely exploded between 2004 and the present. What has come out of all these publications are useful rules for using checklists. Here are the best practices. First, memorize the checklist. Second, analyze the checklist. Look for paradigms, things that must be known, actions that must be performed, and anything that triggers a change in the paradigm or should. Work on memory to action kinetics. When you memorize the checklist and rehearse the checklist, what actually must be done? Anticipate what's next. Once the checklist is memorized, use it not to direct actions, but to verify actions. And that's one of the reasons it is so helpful to have a second or third person responding to a crisis. Always verify each action. Establish an action to verify. If there's no action to verify, there's nothing for the checklist to do. It is best to have each member of the team memorize the checklist and be competent both to direct the process and to verify the process. That's not always possible in the hospital section, correction, in the hospital setting, but it's a very, very useful goal to try to reach. Most importantly, the checklist must be available immediately in written form for consultation. If the checklist is not available, it is not functioning in the optimal way in which it could. There are five common objections to using a checklist. The first is, I don't need a checklist, 
I know how to do this. I've done it for 30 years. I do it by reflex. And the answer is fatigue or being stressed or overwhelmed impairs the ability to do things by reflex. The second is I know it by heart, to which the answer is yes, but perhaps sometimes you forget. The third is I do it my way. So I think that's terrific. Put it in the checklist, whatever your way is, validate it and teach it and prove it. The next is every case is different. That's very true, but almost always these are differences without distinction. And finally, I don't practice medicine by protocol. And the answer is, but you do want to practice good medicine. What if the evidence favors the use of protocols? And so it certainly seems to do. Now let's be fair. Checklists have limitations. The limitations of checklists include first, the fact that they are only as useful as the effort put into implementation and practice. Second, that they're only as effective as the measures they invoke to mitigate the risk. If the measures are not optimal, neither will be the checklist. And they are only as good as the corresponding science and remediation of the crisis. Remember that for all that we've been talking about checklists, checklists are only a technical solution. The real threat to safety arises when a hospital or any healthcare institution thinks it has solved the problem by handing the patients a checklist and telling them to, unit, to use it. That is only a beginning. You have to get people motivated to cooperate. They need a good understanding of how to implement the checklist and what it actually means. The mistake most commonly made when introducing checklists is to assume that a checklist, a technical solution, can solve a cultural pro a problem. Many doctors resist using checklists because of how they are actually socialized. So 10 important points. First, checklists must be read. All members of the team must be able to read the checklist. Moving the visual focus outside of the checklist seems to create problems, which is why the checklist has to be legible and obvious. Instructions must be acknowledged in sequence and as associated tasks are carried out. The internal logic of the checklist is critical. One must always have an instruction or reminder, such as turn the knob or pick up the pink button, and a confirmation. It is critical to maintain awareness of understanding of the phase of the operation and the task at hand. It doesn't matter whether the operation is a surgical operation or something that is done electively at the bedside or something that is done emergently at the bedside. The phase of the procedure is terribly important. Under emergency situations, there's less room to remediate errors and discipline around the checklist must be tighter. Any misperformance must be recognized and corrected as occurs by another team member. If I take the wrong instrument, the wrong implement, the wrong drug injected the wrong way, it's very helpful to have somebody there to back me up. Look for and note for sources of trouble to improve the cognitive ergonomics of task design and the logic of checklist use. By cognitive ergonomics, we mean where the checklist is, the font in which it's written, how much light is on the checklist, how easy it is to find, how easy it is to recite, and things of that sort. The logic of checklist use is sort of the same idea, but even broader. Who cares if a checklist is used? Is that person in a position to be able to actually implement the checklist? Look for and note sources of trouble to improve the cognitive ergonomics of task design and the logic of checklist use. Practice with a checklist. The transferability of observations from the simulated to the real environment is something that requires further study.
And I think many of you may be in a position, the fortunate position, of having institutions that have devoted themselves to the creation of a simulation laboratory and may be challenged to use checklists in a simulation laboratory. The extent to which the use of checklists in a simulation laboratory actually mimics the real world and the extent to which outcomes will be, again, reflections of what would happen in the real world is something that needs to be studied. So what is the reality check for checklists? There's a very important paper published in The Lancet in 2009 that says, look, checklists summarize and simplify what to do. They measure and provide feedback on outcomes and they improve the culture of safety by building expectations of performance standards into work processes. Widespread deployment of checklists without an appreciation of how or why they work is actually a potential threat to patient safety and to high quality care. The users of the checklist need to be trained, they need to practice, they need to be engaged. Thoughtful deployment of, of uh, checklists of good checklists, in contrast, is highly effective. So perhaps we can ask at this point, are there emergency drills or practice sessions to respond to crises that you have during bedside procedures in your ICU? Please respond yes or no. So 31% of you say yes, you do have emergency drills or practice sessions, and 69% of you say no. We would point out that there ought to be emergency drills, similar, if you will, to fire drills or any other kind of drills that represent what the response needs to be, and they need to be carried out in a realistic enough fashion and often enough that people know what to do. Without that, the checklists are useful, but not really as helpful as they could be if they're integrated in a training system. We would urge you to think about introducing checklists and other cognitive aids alongside standard protocols for monitoring patients and for urgent intervention. We would urge you to consider introducing checklists as part of team building exercises as well as to help you during bedside interventions in the ICU. In fact, use checklists for communication to make sure that no step is left behind. You can develop checklists. There are certainly industry and academically developed checklists but using those as a skeleton structure, you can certainly develop your own. Perhaps you have some unique circumstances. We would urge you to think about that. We view them often because circumstances change. And above all, practice with the checklists. I'm going to turn the session back over to Dr. Constantine who will be um, hosting the questions and comments and discussions. This is the end of the formal presentation, and we would gladly invite your questions, your comments, and a discussion of the points made. Roy? Tio, thank you. Thank you. That was excellent. Um, you know, fielding questions from the audience, there are some common themes in these questions. and. Um, I think these questions will, our responses will actually be reinforcing to the presentation. Uh, so let me go ahead and uh, speak about some of these questions. Uh, again, some of the audience had said, um, why do you need two people for the checklist? And is it really important to memorize the checklist? Um, I think that uh, you had mentioned that the, an outside reviewer to monitor the patient is very important, and that maybe certain elements of the checklist 
may be memorized, but not necessarily memorized, but can act as an assistant or act as assistance to what is going on during a resuscitation uh, or an implementation of a procedure. Uh, so uh, maybe, Tio, you just uh, reinforce those two points a little bit more. Well, thank you for that question. I think it's a very important one. For a checklist to work, there ought to be no surprises on the checklists. When you see what pilots do, usually it's the, the, the pilot and the first officer or the pilot and the co-pilot. What ends up happening is that the person who's reading the checklist actually reads what needs to be done, and the pilot or the person who is actually performing the tasks will put her or his hand on the instrument or on the knob or on the throttle and will actually answer, yes, that has been done in very formal ways. A checklist is fairly formal. In order for it to take less time and be more effective, it should be memorized. That doesn't mean that you rely on the memory, but you rely on committing it to memory in order to make the checklist as smooth as possible and as effective as possible. As for the two people, it's very difficult to both look down at a checklist, look up at a monitor, and look down at the patient. Somebody has to be responsible for monitoring the patient, not the monitors, not the checklists, not the drugs, not the crash cart, but the patient. And so it's very important to have sufficient personnel around the patient to make sure that not only is no step in the response left behind, but the patient isn't left behind as the protocol is being implemented. Oh, thank you. Um, a question I have from one of our colleagues, Tio, is what can we do to change outcomes overnight when implementing checklists? Um, perhaps this relates to different shifts, maybe uh, occurrences that may uh, be different on a weekend. Um, so that's a very good question. It's an excellent question. That's a very good question, and um, I'm glad that you went on and explained it because I was worried that maybe the question meant how could we get an instant effect from the checklist, and that takes a little bit more work. So overnight and in times of change staffing, that's a very good example of exactly when a checklist ought to be in use. Perhaps it can be argued that when you have a team working together constantly who know one another very well, who know the way each uh, thinks and responds, a checklist will not be as immediately effective. However, when you have times of reduced staffing or times when people are over uh, are, are overstressed because there is reduced staffing, or when you have new people coming into an ICU, that's exactly when the checklist is particularly important. It lets you use the checklist to jog your memory and make sure that everything that needs to be done has been done. And no matter what time of day or night, no matter whether it's a weekend or a holiday, having that at hand increasing the likelihood that crisis will be dealt with effectively and efficiently and consistently. Another question that was asked by our audience, Tio, is, um, is the checklist mostly for doctors or for nurses? Uh, I, I think you mentioned as an important element of this presentation that um, there is a component of it being patient-centric or patient and family-centric, and even when we're going to start a bedside procedure, that the eyes and ears of others that are there, uh, that are there, including the patient or a family member, may be beneficial. So in relationship to the utilization of these checklists with doctors or nurses, uh, what do you think about that in regards to uh, the different types of providers uh, using a checklist? My experience in the ICU is that the best ICUs are the ICUs in which you have real teams. And real teams have several different characteristics. One characteristic is that everybody is competent. Another is that it's understood that people are uh, responsible, accountable for their part of whatever is done. The third is that there are certain tasks which are assigned. And the fourth is that nurses um, and PAs and other practitioners within the ICU 
are capable and clearly empowered to intervene when there is a crisis and when they need to. After all, that's why an ICU exists. So, in fact, we found that often nurses are better at implementing checklists than physicians. Is it only for physicians? Decidedly not. This is for all practitioners within the ICU. And our hope is that whether it's the ICU or the perioperative space or the emergency room, any place where a crisis might exist, the checklist notion will become adopted and serve as a cognitive aid to optimizing care and training. Well, this was a fantastic day for me. I enjoyed listening to you speak, Dr. Dr. Doggy, and I want to thank you for all your efforts preparing for and delivering this informative webcast, and thank you to our audience for your participation. Please join us for additional free webcasts in the series on December 16, 2015, and January 12, 2016. This concludes today's Project Dispatch webinar.